It seems appropriate that we shoot this program from the John F. Kennedy Space Center in Florida, NASA's activity here. The shuttle has cleared the tower. Roger, roll. Vehicle rolling from tail south, round 235. This is where man has gone into space from, come back to. Our farthest out technology has been used around here. But we're going to talk about even farther out technology, about visitors from the stars and how we can get to the stars as well. Air Force interest in this problem has been due to our feeling of an obligation to identify and analyze to the best of our ability anything in the air that may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any agency of the United States. Also here in Washington is Stanton Friedman, a physicist who has been involved in nuclear space and research for such companies as General Electric, Westinghouse, and General Motors. He has studied and lectured on UFOs for almost 30 years and is in Washington this week taking part in the International Symposium of the Mutual UFO Network. Mr. Friedman, there are books, there are magazine articles, there are television interview programs which have very little time, such as this one. Give it your best shot. If you are seeking to convince, uh, to convince the skeptical, what do you point to? I'm seeking con to convince the healthy agnostics. The skeptics don't want to listen to the data in my findings. I point to the 2,400 plus landing trace cases, physical changes in the environment collected from 65 countries. I point to the 3,200 cases in Project Blue Book Special Report 14, 20% of which couldn't be explained and are all the characteristics we attribute to flying saucers. I point to the 3,500 pilot sightings collected by a NASA scientist on the West Coast. I point to Bud Hopkins' 140 abductees with a waiting list of 200, and an enormous amount of data in the form of documents, uh, some of them obtained from the government directly, some not so directly, uh, clearly indicating that our planet is being visited, that some UFOs are alien spacecraft, and that we are indeed dealing with a cosmic water gate. There is no way in the world I can tell you everything you always wanted to know about flying saucers in one program, or even five. There's an enormous amount of information out there. There's a lot of nonsense out there, too. Part of our job today is to separate the two. I can't give you all the data. What I can do is sort of take you by the hand and lead you past the evidence that has led me to the conclusions that I've reached after 35 years of study. Four major conclusions. One, the evidence is simply overwhelming that planet Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. In other words, some, underline the sum about 18 times, some UFOs are alien spacecraft. Most are not. I don't care about them. Two, the subject of flying saucers represents a kind of cosmic water gate. That is to say, some few people in the governments of the United States, Canada, undoubtedly many other countries, it is a worldwide problem after all, have known since July 1947 when two crash flying saucers and their crews were recovered in New Mexico that some UFOs are extraterrestrial spacecraft. Three, 
none of the arguments made by a very small group, very noisy debunkers, skeptics, noisy negativists, whatever you want to call them, against the first two conclusions, stand up under careful consideration. Their arguments sound great until you look at the evidence, then they collapse of their own weight. And finally, four, we're dealing with the biggest story of the millennium, visits to planet Earth by alien spacecraft, successful cover-up of the best data, the wreckage, the bodies, etc., by the government for more than 46 years. Strong words. By the time we're finished, I think you'll see how I got to them, and perhaps you'll agree with them as well. With today's modern technology, it's not too difficult to fake any kind of photographs. You know what computers can do. You see it on television all the time. But that isn't so true for pictures of flying saucers taken 20, 30, 40 years ago, even 10 years ago. There are a lot of pictures. I'm sure there are a lot more sitting in people's drawers at home in their cabinets waiting for the breakthrough to come when the government tells all. But we can look at a selection of these. There have been motion pictures. We're getting to the point where there are a lot of uh, video cameras because lots of camcorders are around. His first one was taken, a uh, motion picture, in the southwestern part of the United States near the Four Corners area. You see the very rapid pace across the middle of the picture. That's a natural monument in the background, not a man-made uh, structure. You notice the second one coming after it. That lasts for a total of about 20 frames, roughly one second, not much to work on. So let's slow it down and look at these two going across. Now movie cameras are not ideal scientific instruments because the exposure time is pretty long, 30th of a second or so, uh, compared to what you'd want for a scientific experiment. But it's an interesting piece of photography. There are a lot of decent stills around which have been analyzed by professional scientists. Here's one of two from McMinnville, Oregon, taken by a farmer, Paul Trent, not a sophisticated individual at all. Pictures have been analyzed by Dr. Bruce Maccabee, an optical physicist with a Navy research lab, a very sophisticated individual. He's looked at the original negatives, examined them very carefully. You can see there's two pictures, and then we'll blow up the object, to enlarge it in the second one. Notice the interesting shape and the sort of hood ornament there up at the middle. This next picture was taken near Rouen, France by a French military pilot four years, 6,000 miles away. Same shape, same hood ornament, obviously rented from the same great car rental agency in the sky. This next picture is one of three that were taken near Santa Ana, California by Rex Heflin, who worked for the state uh, highway department. He was driving his van. He had a Polaroid camera on the seat of the car, always did, in the seat of the van. Saw this object, took pictures from inside the van, first out ahead of him. You can see that here. We can enlarge that first one, sort of a hat with the dome on it. Then two pictures taken outside to the right, taken from inside the van, but through the uh, side door window. This is Santa Ana, California. Three years later, and 7,000 miles away, includes Romania. We have another set of three pictures. There were three witnesses to this one, two people watching the guy take the pictures. They were analyzed in Romania, again in England, published in one of the better journals, the Flying Saucer Review. Here's yet another object from Belodic, Yugoslavia, that looks like the same model. Nobody's saying they all look alike, just as obviously our spacecraft don't all look alike. Here's another set of pictures, this time from Salt Lake City, Utah. There's a sequence of seven. I've seen the negatives uncut, taken by a professional photographer. There's no building there. There's nothing reflecting off glass. Uh, you can follow the object as it moves from left to right across the sky. And yes, that's the Mormon temple in Salt Lake City. And then we'll enlarge number five, one through seven there, you see. Enlarge number five. And I think that region around the object is an ionized air plasma related to a magneto-aerodynamic propulsion system. The next picture is from Hawaii. The objects in the upper right-hand portion. You notice the palm trees and the hula girls. And here's a blow-up of that same frame. That's Hawaii. Uh, here's one from Yungay, Peru. Two objects in this one in the upper left-hand portion of the picture. And here's a sequence from Trindadi, 
Trindagi, I'm told it's pronounced, 600 miles east of the coast of Brazil. The ship was there as part of the International Geophysical Year and had an official Brazilian Navy photographer on board. There had been a sighting earlier in the week in that area. It was broad daylight, suddenly everybody shouts, hey, there goes a flying saucer, take a picture, in Portuguese, of course. Grabs his camera, takes the pictures, takes six of them, four of them show the object. As the object came in from the right at high speed, makes a sharp turn and takes off again, a Saturn-shaped object like the planet Saturn. The pictures were eventually released to the public by the president of Brazil, Jocelino Kubitschek. Here's the first one. This is at some distance now. Here's number two. Here's number three. And here's number four, and this is the best of the batch, so we'll blow that one up and we'll enlarge it once again. And we're kind of back where we started. At least 50 different companies on this planet that could build things that look like that. But I know of none that back in the 50s could build things that look like that and fly like that. High speed, sharp turn, no noise, no visible external engines, no wings, no tail. If it wasn't built here on Earth, it was built someplace else. And it's time we did something about it. What I'm trying to do is to make you aware of the overwhelming evidence that some UFOs are extraterrestrial spacecraft. To remind you of something you already know, that is to say we all do have something on, in common on this planet, we're all Earthlings. And also to demonstrate that we're dealing with a cosmic water gate. We've been able to explain them as uh, hoaxes, as erroneously identified friendly aircraft, as meteorological or electronic phenomena, or as light aberration. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. My first reaction was Polaroid? It's got to be real. I mean, how do you fake a Polaroid? <laughs> and that's what had me convinced to go ahead and put it in the paper right away. With all due respect to the Air Force, I believe that some of them will prove to be of interplanetary origin. During a three-year investigation, I found that many pilots have described objects of substance and high speed. One case, pilots reported their plane was buffeted by an object which passed them at 500 miles an hour. Obviously, this was a solid object, and I believe it was from outer space. Well, you'll hear that over and over again, everywhere I go. How come most people don't believe in UFOs? You must be the only scientist that believes in UFOs. Let's look at the facts. Here are the results of four Gallup polls that have been taken, asking the same question. Do you think UFOs are real, imaginary, or you're not sure? Even back in the mid-60s, before we'd been to the moon, the believers outnumbered non-believers one and a half to one. In the late 70s, it was better than two to one believers over non-believers. Now, admittedly, sometimes the data's been sort of misrepresented because they leave out the not sure types. I remember a newspaper headline that said only 46% believe in UFOs, implying that 54% did not. The fact was only 29% did not. The rest couldn't make up their mind one way or another. Anyway, you'll notice that in the most recent of the polls, and there was another one within the last couple of years, shows the same result. The believers still outnumber the non-believers by one and a half to one. Now, every politician would like odds like that at the election. Now. A skeptic might say at this point, hey, I know why that is. That's because all those supermarket tabloids have convinced people that there's something to flying saucers. Right? Wrong. That's a testable hypothesis. If it were true that it was the influence of the crazy stories in the tabloids, then presumably the greater the education, the less likely to believe in flying saucers because I think it's fair to expect that people with more education are going to be less influenced by the tabloids. Well, if you look at the bottom of this information, the bottom part of this story, you'll see quite the reverse. Now, admittedly, for adults, and this is all adults now, it's not children, 
adults with only a grade school education. The non-believers slightly outnumber the believers. Getting a high school diploma makes believers over non-believers two to one. And with a college background, it's almost three to one. Simple conclusion, the better the education, the greater the education of the individual, the more likely to believe in flying saucers. I've often wondered, what if all of us in the world discovered that we were threatened by an outer a power from outer space, from another planet, wouldn't we all of a sudden find that we didn't have any differences between us at all? Ronald Reagan made allusions to alien forces not once, but five different times, including a speech before the United Nations. And why did he say that five times? Once it's a nice figure of speech, but he said it in the United Nations, he said it to Gorbachev in Geneva, Gorbachev responded saying you didn't disagree with him. He said it at a high school in Maryland. Why bring that up unless there was some reason for bringing it up? The greater the education, the more likely to believe. That's exactly the opposite of what the skeptics have been trying to tell us for decades, but they don't have any data. If you're a believer, you're with the cream of the crop. It's time to come out of the closet. You're not at the bottom of the barrel. Let's stop being apologist ufologist and closet ufologist. Let's tell it like it is. While in space as command pilot on Gemini 5, astronaut general James McDivitt saw an unidentified object approach his spacecraft and then move away when he tried to film it. One astronaut who actually chased a UFO while a fighter pilot in Germany in 1951 is Colonel Gordon Cooper. One of the original seven Mercury astronauts, Colonel Cooper sent this letter to the United Nations November 9th, 1978, to express his view on UFOs. I believe that these extraterrestrial vehicles and their crews are visiting this planet from other planets, which obviously are a little more technically advanced than we are here on Earth. Incidentally, a poll taken of engineers and scientists involved in research and development activities, twice no less, shows that two-thirds of those who express, expressed an opinion said they're real too. So you're in very good company. As a presidential candidate, Jimmy Carter vowed to completely open the government's UFO files because Carter said he had seen one himself. In 1977, there were hints in national magazines that disturbing revelations were about to be made by the president. They never were and Carter didn't open the files. We wrote to ask him why, and we're told Carter is too busy for any interviews. In the early days, the arguments were all along the lines. First of all, what people claim to have observed is obviously impossible, so they couldn't have observed it. Now, let's understand, that's backwards science. The observations are real, whether you understand them or not is beside the point. I mean, the sun has been fusioning, that's how it produces its energy, for five billion years. We figured out how it worked in 1937. Does anybody want to suggest because we didn't know how it worked that it wasn't working? That's nonsense, that's not science. Now the list of its impossibles has shrunk as we've accomplished those objectives over the last four decades or so, many by work that you can see here. But there are two arguments that are still being made, technological arguments. The first of the it's impossible arguments is that you can't get here from there. It's usually made in a much fancier way, uh, and typically by astronomers for reasons which I don't understand. The argument goes like this. It's a huge universe out there, billions of light years, billions of galaxies, billions of stars. Surely there's life all over the place out there. And some of that life must be more advanced than we are because they've been around a lot longer than we are. Life all over the place. but you can't get here from there. So give us a few bucks, we'll build a radio telescope and listen for signals because undoubtedly the more advanced civilizations are trying to attract our attention with radio signals. You know, hello Earth, hello Earth, just waiting for us to join the galactic radio network. Did you ever hear such silly nonsense in your life? Especially when you add into the picture, as one professor suggested, when we hook into the network, they will then transmit to us all the secrets of the universe. Why would an advanced civilization give its secrets to a primitive society whose major activity is tribal warfare? 
that's us in case you didn't recognize the description. Would make as much sense to give two-year-olds loaded guns to play with. Now, you can't get here from there. Right? Wrong. Now, we can go to the scientific record. There have been loads of papers published, and what a track record it is for the astronomy community. Back in 1903, a great American astronomer, Simon Newcomb, October 1903, published a paper in which he showed that the only way man would ever fly would be with the help of a lighter-than-air vehicle, a balloon. That was two months before the Wright brothers' first flight. When he heard about the flight, his comment was, well, maybe a pilot, but they certainly never carry any passengers. We know how right he was. Another great astronomer in the 20s said that, proved mathematical equations, that it would be impossible ever to give anything sufficient energy to get it into orbit around the Earth. You don't have to look far around here to know how wrong that was. Yeah, we're getting some uh, really spectacular uh, video downlink from the payload bay cameras. Uh, you guys are just passed over Hudson Bay, we believe, and uh, I guess we're seeing a lot of cloud patterns over Hudson Bay. Just before that, we're seeing large bodies of water. My favorite, though, is a Canadian astronomer, Dr. Campbell. 1941, he was sick and tired of all this science fiction stuff about going to the moon. So he did a scientific paper in which he tried to calculate the required initial launch weight of a rocket. Just a chemical rocket, which is what all these are, able to get a man to the moon and back. That's a legitimate question, how big would it have to be? Pages of equations, bottom line, the required initial launch weight of a chemical rocket able to get a man to the moon and back would be a million, million tons. Now, even for me, that's too big. But isn't it interesting that less than 30 years later, we got three guys to the moon and back, still with the chemical rocket, whose initial launch weight, one of the members of the Saturn family, like this one back here, the initial launch weight wasn't a million million tons, it was 3,000 tons. He was off by a factor of 300 million. How could he be so far off? Because he made all the wrong assumptions. How could such a respected academic professor be so far off in his calculations? He wasn't the first, and he certainly won't be the last. His problem was that he made all the wrong assumptions because he didn't know anything about space travel. That's what aeronautical engineers are for. For example, he assumed a single-stage rocket. None of our manned space launches have been done with single-stage rockets. Two, three stages, more like it. Saves a lot on weight. He assumed a limit of 1G acceleration for the rocket. Now, certainly we can all stand 1G, but the astronauts who get on these babies sometimes are subjected to 5, 6, or 7Gs. The escape tower on the old Apollo uh, spacecraft and the Mercury and so forth, if the astronauts had to come off the rocket real quick because there was a problem down below, they would have to take 13Gs without damage either, it was expected. That makes an enormous difference. He assumed he launched straight up. Well, if anybody comes here knows, you bend over pretty quick, you launch to the east, you do a lot of cosmic freeloading. Another example of freeloading, something we do on all our deep space shots, incidentally, it's not a bad word, is he assumed, quite correctly, that when you came back to Earth from the moon, you would, of course, have to slow down. I mean, that goes without saying. You're going 25,000 miles an hour. That's not a good landing speed. But he assumed the only way you could do that would be to turn the rocket around and fire the retro rocket to slow you down. But of course, every pound of propellant you use at the end had to be launched from the Earth at the beginning, slowed down at the moon, launched from the moon. Most of it slowed down back here. And it takes at least 10 pounds of propellant per pound of payload to move it through each of these steps. What do we do? We get runway. smart instead of powerful. We say the atmosphere is already here. Let's Manual use it. We convert the problem from brute force into hitting the atmosphere at just the proper angle. If you come in too steep, you dig a big hole in the ground. Not a good way to make a land. If you come in too shallow, you go right on by the Earth. That's not a good way to get home either. 
can open. But if you do things properly, you come down, it doesn't take any propellant at the end of the trip. So he was far off, no question about that. But can you get here from there or not? There are loads of papers by aeronautics experts, astronautics experts, engineers, showing that trips to nearby stars, our local neighborhood again, within less than 50 light years, are feasible with round trip times shorter than the average person's lifespan and without violating or even amending any of our most sacred laws of physics and using staged fission or fusion propulsion systems, two different nuclear techniques, on both of which I have worked. I said staged again, you notice. Now some people might think, uh-oh, here comes the science fiction. Gotta have science fiction and flying saucers, right? Wrong. There really were nuclear rocket programs. I've worked on both fission and fusion. The NRX A6 nuclear rocket reactor propulsion system, reactor's only about this big, had a power level of 11 100 megawatts, half the power of Grand Coulee Dam. I worked for Westinghouse on that one. That was preceded, incidentally, just to surprise you a little more. Aircraft nuclear propulsion systems in the late 50s. We successfully operated jet engines on nuclear power. Nuclear ramjets in the mid 60s successfully operated nuclear power on the ground. Now, the fission program was the largest, and we had a whole bunch of different systems that we tested. Here's the Phoebus 2B. Los Alamos built these, a whole series of them. Very similar to the NRX A6, a little larger, maybe this big. The most powerful one had a power level of 4,400 megawatts. That's twice the power of the old Grand Coulee Dam, this big. Now, this isn't Walt Disney now in a science fiction movie. This is reality. That ran, and these pictures were taken from a long distance away. You don't want to be close to one of these things when they're operating. That's nuclear fission. Yes, it's the same energy conversion process that's used in nuclear-powered submarines, aircraft carriers, uh, cruisers. There's over 300 nuclear-powered ships out there. They won't take you into space. But really, I'm much more excited about nuclear fusion. That may seem like a strange word to you, to you realize nuclear fusion is the most important source of energy in all our lives. The sun up there is not a mass of burning gas, no oilmen up there. The sun is a fusion factory. That's the process that produces the energy. Now, it's true that indeed H-bombs involve fusion as well. That's controlled fusion, but for a very short period of time. Anyway, back in the early 60s, I worked on nuclear fusion propulsion systems. Government-sponsored contract. We didn't test hardware like the fission rockets. But give the program, oh, I don't know, $60 billion in 20 years, you'd have man-rated, very exciting, deep space fusion propulsion systems. What's the big deal about fusion? Well, there are two big deals. One is if you use the right stuff in the right way, you can kick particles out the back end of a fusion rocket, only in space now that have 10 million times as much energy per particle as they can get in one of these chemical rockets. On a miles per gallon basis, surely fusion is the way to go. In addition, the stuff you use to kick out the back end, isotopes of hydrogen and helium, which just happen to be the two lightest and most abundant substances in the universe. Wherever you go, the gas stations may be closed, but you're going to find hydrogen and helium. So we earthlings already know how to get to the stars. It's a political choice. Do we want to spend the money? I'm not saying we should, but we don't need new laws of physics. Just one heck of a lot of good engineering such as went into this and courage.
This home videotape was recorded during one of the trips to the Groom Mountains. Okay. Good luck. No, what? Did you see that move it did? No, I didn't. It because went like I this. kept doing... Wow, look how bright it's getting. Look at it now. It's getting bright. Not here, bright hold. enough for me to get the sun of a bitch. Here, hold on, right here. Are you, are you there? No. It's bright right now. So progress comes from doing things differently. That also applies when you move over to the other big objection to space travel, deep space travel, and coming here and then making right angle turns. You'd be crushed to death against the walls, some noisy negativists say. They can't possibly make right angle turns like that. There's a book, uh, Physics for People Who Don't Think They'd Like Physics, and I don't like the book, which says when you get to nine Gs, you die. Nonsense. NASA here has learned an awful lot about what kind of accelerations people can stand. Uh, they've done tests on centrifuges, rev them up. Uh, there's talk about courage, physical courage. Now, one G is the acceleration of gravity here at the surface of the Earth. That's a change in speed of 21 miles per hour per second. So at 1G, in other words, say you're in a very hot car, in 10 seconds at 1G, you could get to 210 miles an hour. That's a pretty hot car. OK, how much can people stand? Well, it depends on a lot of things. One of the things is the direction of the force on the body. You'll notice that when any of the astronauts go up, they're always on their back. Not like in an elevator, they're not standing up and the rocket goes up this way, but the force is back to front. Why is that? That's because they can stand a lot more acceleration back to front than foot to head. Well, how much can they stand? A trained pilot, this is measured data now, a trained pilot can handle 14 Gs for two minutes and perform a tracking task while being accelerated. Now, what does that mean? 14 G is an acceleration of just about 300 miles per hour per second. So if you were starting from rest and being kicked at 14 Gs, and it would certainly feel like it, at the end of one second, you're going 300 miles an hour. At the end of 10 seconds, you're going 3,000 miles an hour. And at the end of those two minutes, you're going 36,000 miles an hour, and you're long since out of sight and off the Earth. That's measured data, not theoretical, hypothetical, I wish we could, but we can, so we won't kind of data. Now, in actuality, we can stand higher G-loadings than that. The shorter the duration, the more the G-loadings you can stand. For example, this is test data. You can stand 30 Gs for one second. What does that mean? That's zero to 600 miles an hour in one second. Uh, it came up above the same mountain. It moved around. It did a step move. It actually went up in the air like this and hovered then dropped way down, then it just floated around and cruised around, and then it started coming up the mountain range. Now, when people report flying saucers, the time during which you go around the corner is very, very short. As a matter of fact, it appears that you could stand any acceleration as long as the duration is sufficiently short. I call it the hot potato syndrome. You're baking potatoes in the oven, it's time to take them off, out of the oven put them on the table, you grab the potato, do you get burned or not? It depends on how long you hold on to the potato. Obviously, if you stay below some very short time, you're not going to get burned. When you go past that time, you're going to be hurt. Through the telescope, we had seen it was an elliptically shaped light. You know, that's, that's about, because you can only get so close, even with a telescope to a secure facility. Anyway, it came by, uh, uh, up by us very rapidly. It glowed and glowed brighter like a sun. And, and we almost got the feeling it was going to explode. It glowed so bright. And we backed up behind the car. Then it went down. It glowed back up a little bit and very softly uh, glided back over back where the, the mountains where it came up, hovered for a while, and then just sat down, just like you see in the movies. Now, obvious question, of course. So how do you get such a high acceleration? Now, when we physicists accelerate particles in these big accelerators to very high speeds, close to the speed of light, which is an important part of this story, 
We don't do it by hiring grad students and hitting the particles as they go by with a broomstick or something like that. We do it electromagnetically. You've got charged particles, you can hit them with electric and magnetic forces and really get them moving. Now, we talk about hypermaneuverability. We all know very maneuverable systems, uh, Volkswagens, uh, old O.J. Simpsons, uh, a lot of different systems that don't work by carrying along something you throw away, that work by interacting with their surroundings. In the mid-60s, a brilliant professor named Stuart Way, working at Westinghouse, built, with the help of some grad students at the University of California, Santa Barbara, an electromagnetic submarine cost him $2,000 for spare parts and stuff, and it worked. No moving parts. Electric and magnetic fields at right angles to each other exert a force at right angles to both. You push against the seawater, which is an electrically conducting fluid. By Newton's laws, it pushes back, and off you go, slipping silently through the seawater. No moving parts. Now, that was a proof of principle device. It worked. Now, you may think, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's any of this got to do with flitting around in the atmosphere? Well, if you replace the electrically conducting fluid, seawater, with ionized air, that's the stuff that glows when a meteor comes in. That's the stuff that surrounds one of the capsules when the manned capsules come back to Earth and they're rushing through the atmosphere, very high speed, slowing down, heating the air. It becomes an electrically conducting fluid and we have that blackout period. Remember that when the men came down? If you have an ionized air plasma around a vehicle, this is based on measured data, you can control heating, drag, lift, radar profile, little stealth activity there, and sonic boom production. All of these relate to the layer of air around the vehicle. So this is not an incredible technology. Interesting, different, not easy to play with in your basement, but the wave of the future is a magneto-aerodynamic propulsion system. In a moment, we'll examine the extraordinary and controversial story of a strange craft that crashed in New Mexico in 1947. This Air Force base here in Roswell, New Mexico, was the center of a controversy back in 1947 that over 40 years later still remains unsolved. Remnants of a mysterious craft were found on a remote ranch and allegedly stored here in Hangar 84. To this day, there are many who believe it was a UFO. When we first heard of the incident at Roswell, we assumed it was just another UFO sighting. It could be easily explained. A distant aircraft, an errant missile, or perhaps it was just a hoax. However, eyewitness accounts and disturbing evidence suggest that something strange happened here at Roswell. This is the front page of the Chicago Daily News for July 8th, 1947. This is an evening paper. And almost all evening papers for that day from Chicago West carried this incredible story about Army finds air saucer on ranch in New Mexico. This goes to high officers. This is the front page of the Roswell Daily Record, an evening newspaper for July 8, 1947. That's Roswell, New Mexico, town in the southeastern quadrant of New Mexico. Roswell Army Airfield captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region. This is the front page of the Sacramento, California Bee, an evening paper, July 8th, 1947. Not quite so flamboyant. This is the front page with very flamboyant headlines of the Los Angeles Herald Express, an evening paper, July 8th, 1947. Now you'll notice it has the original story, the same as the others. But now it's got a second story. General believes it is radar weather gadget. Now, you notice that California is two hours behind Chicago, New Mexico one hour. What's going on here? 
We need a context here. The first UFO sighting to get national attention occurred in the Pacific Northwest on June 24th, 1947, just two weeks earlier than these headlines. Kenneth Arnold, a private pilot in broad daylight, was searching for a downed aircraft in the mountains of Washington State, and he spotted nine objects that moved, as he later described it, as a saucer would if you skipped it across the water. He reported it when he landed. The press picked up on it. He didn't say they looked like flying saucers, but the press coined the term flying saucer. UFO wasn't used until after 1950. Within the next two weeks, there were sightings in 40-some states and several other countries. And it was headline material. Army fighter planes are on patrol for flying saucers. Cameras installed to photograph them. Portland, Oregon, the area from which came the first weird reports. This flying saucer patrol shows how the Air Forces, while not putting too much stock in the mysterious things in the sky, are investigating. The control so towers this in touch, happened and on the watch, apparently on the about the July the 2nd or 3rd. A rancher named Mac Brazel on a ranch out in the boondocks, 75 miles or so northwest of Roswell, 15 miles southeast of the little town of Corona. Heard a tremendous explosion late one night during the middle of an electrical storm. He didn't think it was thunder, though. The next morning, he's out checking on a water pump. This is a sheep ranch out in the boonies. It's pretty dry, and water's very important. And he comes across an area three quarters of a mile long, a few hundred feet wide, strewn with pieces of strange wreckage. It was weird. There were pieces of a foil-like material, about the thickness of a foil on a pack of cigarettes. But you couldn't tear it, couldn't break through it. Later on, with a 16-pound sledgehammer, you couldn't break through it. Extraordinarily strong and extraordinarily light. There were some I-beam-shaped pieces, nothing bigger than about this long, about a half inch high, about the weight of balsa wood next to nothing, but you couldn't cut them, break them, burn them, and there were strange pastel symbols along the inside. According to my dad, there was a bad thunderstorm the night before, and the next day he was out on the ranch and he found this debris. And he picked it all up in his pickup and was talking to people, and of course there was some talk about UFOs. He was going to Roswell, and as far as I know, he got in touch with the Sheriff's Department. They, in turn, called the Air Force. Brazel, a rancher, the ranch had no electricity. He hadn't heard all these stories about flying saucers. There was a neighbor's young son visiting there because he liked to ride horseback with Mac. When Mac took him back to his home, the Porter family, uh, he asked the neighbors, to come out and see this stuff. He took some pieces with him. They handled it. They remember it. A Proctor family, Loretta Proctor. The PC brought up the Proctor. Kind of a tan, light brown plastic is what it looked like. This no plastic now, but then we didn't have any plastic with <laughs> Finally, on July 6th, a Sunday, Mac decides to put some of the pieces of this junk in the back of his pickup truck and go into Roswell. He goes to the Sheriff Wilcox's office, tells the sheriff he's got this stuff. The sheriff looks at it, calls the base, the local Roswell Army Airfield. I asked him, uh, do you think this is true? And uh, he said, I don't know why Brazel would have come all the way in here and brought that stuff if it hadn't been something important and that he didn't, that he had to be something that he thought was that. It was a very special base. It was the home of the 509th Composite Bomb Group. That's the group that dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and out in the Pacific in 1946. Hand-picked officers, hand-picked men, high security, a very elite special group. Flying B-29s, the Cold War was already heating up at that time. The sheriff, by prearrangement, called the base, talks to the base intelligence officer, Major Jesse Marcel. There was a pre-existing arrangement to do that. 
Jesse checks with his boss, and he, Colonel Blanchard, base commander, head of the 509th, goes into town, looks at the stuff, realizes it is indeed very strange, gets instructions to go with the counterintelligence corps man. Remember, this is highly classified base, lots of highly classified activity in New Mexico. Take the counterintelligence corps man, Sheridan Cavett, with you, see what's going on out there. The material that we saw, this looked like it, it had, whatever it caused it, it was just like whatever there, it was just uh, vaporized. Now, there was no way you could tell Jesse and Cabot how to get there. It was out in the boonies. They had to follow the rancher out there. Took their sleeping bags, stayed overnight, had a can of beans, as Jesse told me. The next morning, the rancher shows them this area. And Jesse's mystified. One thing I was certain of, being familiar with all our activities, that it was not a weather balloon, nor an aircraft, nor a missile. It was something else of which we didn't know what it was. There were just fragments strewn all over the area, an area about three quarters of a mile long and several hundred feet wide. If there's all this wreckage, there had to be some kind of an explosion. He can't find a crater, so it must have happened in midair. They load two vehicles, an Army carry-all and a Buick, with as much of this stuff as they can fit in. And there was lots of it left behind. And they head back toward town. It's late now. Jesse stops at home, wakes his wife and 11-year-old son, brings in some of the pieces of stuff to the kitchen table. They try to fit the pieces together to get some idea of how big this thing must have been. Uh, there was a black plastic type debris, like Bakelite, which was shattered. It was very brittle material. And then there were uh, fragments of what appeared to be I-beams. And the son is important because he's now a medical doctor, Jesse Marcel, Jr. He's a pilot. He's a flight surgeon. He served on military aircraft accident investigative teams was himself shot down in Southeast Asia. He knows wreckage. He has never seen anything like it, including those strange symbols. Well, the most unusual part of this whole thing was what was on the I-beam, on the inner surface of the I-beam. Because uh, as you look at it head on, there appeared to be a type of writing. Well, Jesse goes into the base the next morning, and Colonel Blanchard gives two orders. One is to Jesse, get one of the B-29 crews to take you and this stuff up to Wright Field in Ohio. It's now Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. All the base names changed when the Air Force became a separate body in September of 47, after this took place. Make a stop at our headquarters. The 509th was part of the 8th Air Force, which was part of the Strategic Air Command, then headquartered in Washington, in the Washington, D.C. area. 8th Air Force headquarters was in Fort Worth, Texas, and that's right on the way to Ohio. I was in that operations office and Colonel Blanchard drove up and came in and asked, is the aircraft ready? And I and one other fellow there, who was now dead, uh, said, yes, it's sitting right out front, ready to go. The second order he gave was to the base public information officer, a man named Walter Hout, to put out a press release announcing that they'd recovered the wreckage of one of these flying discs that people had been seeing for two weeks. Got the telephone call from Colonel Blanchard, and in essence, he told me that uh, we had, in, he had in his possession a flying saucer or parts thereof. Gave me a little bit of idea where it came from, and <clears throat> ranch north, west of Roswell. Walter did that at about noon New Mexico time. He wrote the release on the commander's orders, took it to the four media outlets in town, two radio stations, two newspapers. One of them put it on the wire. It went out all over the world, and the phones didn't stop ringing in Roswell, at the sheriff's office, at the base, at the newspapers, at the radio stations, calls from London, England, and all over the world. Meanwhile. Jesse's in a plane with some of the wreckage and a whole crew on the way to Fort Worth, Texas. Before they had even arrived there, Colonel, then Colonel Thomas Jefferson DuBose, who was Chief of Staff to General Roger Ramey, head of the 8th Air Force, had already taken a call from Clements McMullen, the acting head of the Strategic Air Command in Washington, telling him in no uncertain terms, they knew each other, I want you to cover up that story. I don't care how you do it. I want you to send some of that wreckage up here with one of your Colonel couriers. 
and I don't want you ever to talk about it again, not even with your buddy Roger Ramey, Commander of the 8th Air Force. That's an order. Do I need to put it in writing, Colonel? No, sir. Again, you follow orders. He took care of it by having the wreckage of a radar reflector from a weather balloon brought in. That's what it was. To his office, no less. Strange place to bring wreckage. The media guys are waiting because of the wire service story. And gentlemen, he says, the general says, we made a terrible mistake. It's not a flying disc or flying saucer at all. It's just a radar reflector from a weather balloon. What are you going to do with the wreckage, general? Oh, throw it out. What else? Now, the cover story went out about 5 o'clock, July 8th, 1947, Texas time. That was too late for the Eastern papers and even the Chicago paper. But that's why the Los Angeles paper has the original story and the cover story. And the next morning's papers all said, Ramey empties Roswell saucer. And that's where the story lay until I got involved in 1978. <laughs> Inflating an immense balloon aboard the USS Norton Sound, the Navy prepares for further study of the elusive cosmic rays somewhere in the Pacific. That's the news. A secondary consideration clears up the mystery of the so-called flying saucers. For it is these monsters which rise 19 miles and attain diameters of 100 feet that have been mistaken for the apparitions called flying saucers. At great altitudes, they tell us, these elongated enormities flatten out like plates. Mystery ended. Some people said, why did they come running to you with their story, Major Marcel? He didn't. I was at a television station, and the station uh, manager, we were waiting for a third reporter to interview me. I was going to be speaking at uh, Louisiana State University, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And he, out of the blue, the station manager says, you know, the guy you ought to talk to is Jesse Marcel. And I say, who's he? He says, oh, we're old ham radio operating operators. We're buddies. And he handled pieces of the wreckage of one of these things when he was in the service. Well, that got my attention. I said, well, do you know anything about it? He says, he lives over in Houma, Louisiana which wasn't too far, although I didn't know where it was at the time. I've since been there. I called Jesse the next day, got his story. I didn't remember the date. It sounded pretty straight. Not long thereafter, I got another story. I was at Bemidji, Minnesota, about another story about a crash saucer. A couple asked me if I'd heard about a crash saucer in New Mexico. I said, well, I have heard stories. Tell me more. Well, their friend, Barney Barnett, a soil conservation service engineer, ultra respectable, living in the town of Socorro, New Mexico, told them quietly, very good friends, that a saucer, he'd found an in, almost intact saucer stuck in the ground in New Mexico with bodies alongside it. They didn't have the date either. We had a third story, a colleague of mine, about an English actor driving across the country when he was in New Mexico, heard the radio broadcast about this story. When he got to the East Coast, thought it'd be a big deal, nothing. That gave us the date, early July 1947. A colleague, William Moore, went to the University of Minnesota libraries, dug out newspapers. There were the stories. The stories, many of them were inaccurate, but they had names, they had information. They gave us a check on Jesse Marcel. Everything he said was true. It gave us the name of Walter Howe. It gave us the name of uh, Colonel Blanchard and a whole bunch of other names. We followed up on those stories. The Barney Barnett story, we got, found his niece, we found neighbors, we found his boss. That story took place west of Socorro, which is about 160 miles west of the Corona site. And that left us puzzled. If there are bodies over there, why weren't there bodies here? Were there two vehicles? Was there one vehicle that had broken apart? It was a mystery. By 1985, we talked to 90 people, and we still hadn't resolved were there two crashes, one crash that broke up, or whatever. But then, after Unsolved Mysteries did their show on crash saucers, I instigated it, helped out, found a number of the people. I also was able to find and talk to Glenn Dennis, a mortician in Roswell at the Ballard Funeral Home, which handled the base's business. And he told me, a story he'd never told anybody else. Glenn told the story 
that he got several calls in early July from the base mortuary officer. What should they do? What would he advise? Uh, did, what was the smallest uh, body bags that they had there? And I think I informed him that we usually kept a four foot, but I could possibly get a three six. What fluids could you use to treat uh, a body that had been out in the sun for a long time and uh, that wouldn't interfere with later analysis of body fluids? What would your procedures do to change in the, uh, like the chemical compounds, the tissues, the uh, blood and all that? What would that do? Uh, would that destroy any of it? And Glenn says, well, was there a crash? Well, no, th th this is all hypothetical. And he said, well, you know, when bodies are in a crash, you can fit them in a five-gallon jug. No, these bodies weren't in a crash, but they were out in the desert for several days. Well, later that day, Glenn drove the ambulance, which was also a hearse, of course, in those days, dropped an airman off at the base hospital, parked it around the back, went in to see a friend of his who was a nurse in the base hospital. It was hot, just going to get a Coke. This nurse had only been there. She'd only been commissioned like around three months. And she had graduated from college and taken the state boards and gotten her license, and then she went into the service. He sees two army ambulances out there with strange sort of half canoe-like segments in them and MPs guarding. And they challenged him. He says, well, I'm Glenn Dennis. I'm the mortician. He belonged on the base. He had clearances and stuff to get on the base. Anyway, as I started back to see her, before I got to the, before I got back to the lounge, there was some uh, examining rooms on each side of the hall. And <clears throat> she came out of one of the examining rooms and coming across the hallway. And I noticed she had a, I don't know, it was a handkerchief or a piece of gauze what over her mouth. And then she saw me and she said, uh, what are you doing here and how did you get in here? She said, my gosh, get out of here as soon as possible. She said, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. Which is a strange way to be greeted. And there's a military guy there who shrieks at him, get that SOB out of here. Who is he? Nobody likes being called an SLB, and he did use the words. And he's confused about what's going on here. And this guy's yelling some more, get him out of here. And then Glenn said the wrong thing. Has there been a crash? Don't you go telling any stories about a crash? This guy's lambasting him verbally. And Glenn says, you can't do anything to me. I'm a civilian. Now, there's a black sergeant there. There's a red-headed, nasty officer, but I didn't know it when Glenn first told the story. And the sergeant says, we use guys like you for dog food. Glenn gets mad and says, we use guys like you for coyote bait. Great dialogue, but there's a reason for telling you that. Anyway, he gets literally escorted out, MPs on each side, taking him out to his hearse, follow him back to the funeral home. He gets a call later from the officer. Don't you ever say anything. And he still doesn't know what's going on. He said, you did not see anything. There was no crash here. You don't go into town and make any rumors that you saw anything that there was any crashes. The next morning, he leaves word for the nurse, and she calls him back. And they meet at the officer's club, and she's very upset. She had been in, going to get some supplies. And in the room she goes into, there are a couple of doctors autopsying three strange bodies there. And the stench was terrible. She said, the doctor said, hey, this isn't anything we've ever seen before in our life, and there's no textbook that's ever covered this, you know. She saw the bodies, but she wanted to get out of there. And they said, oh, you can't leave. Well, I've got chores to do. Oh, no, you've got to help us. And she's taking notes while they're dictating in this terrible smell. I said it was, it was the most gruesome, most horrible sight that she'd ever seen in her life. The smell was, it was almost devastating. She said, I was never so horrified in my life. And she said, I don't know if I'll ever sleep again or anything else. She said, I've never seen anything so gruesome. She drew for Glenn what the bodies looked like. The upper arm was longer than the lower arm. Big heads, small bodies, big eyes, practically no nose, mouth, ears. Four fingers, no thumb, long, slender fingers. She drew that for him, and he had a promise where he'd never talk about it. She drew me a diagram of the head. She drew me a diagram of the arms and, and the hands. And it was on the back of a prescription pad, where, you know, the nurses always carried a prescription pad, you know, and I'll take the notes and everything for the doctors and all that. 
these were rather small, but she had drawn those the night before, and she and she gave them to me. She said, you know, that you can have these, but there again, I was sworn to secrecy again that, you know, either destroy them after I got through with them or whatever. Glenn's testimony then opened up the notion that there were two vehicles that crashed. After the Unsolved Mysteries program ran, there are many more witnesses came forward. This is what led uh, aviation and science writer Don Berliner, who's also been interested in UFOs for more than 30 years, and I, to do our book, Crash at Corona, with the latest testimony. And, you know, one thing that should be stressed here, there was very strong intimidation about to witnesses not to talk about what they saw. As an example of that, the sheriff's granddaughter, many years later, was living with her grandmother. The sheriff was dead. And there was something on television about flying sauce. And the grandmother said, you know, I've never told you, but the reason your grandfather didn't rerun for sheriff is that when that saucer crashed, he saw quite a lot. And after things were quieted down, the military came to him and said, if you ever talk about what you saw, we will kill you and we will kill your family. She, she was standing there with my grandfather. I said, did you hear them say that, big mom? That's what I called mm -hmm. her. And she said, yes, I did, Barbara. And she said, that's exactly what they told her. Now, let me go back to the little story about the dog food. I learned that the most classified base, probably in New Mexico, this was Sandia base up in Albuquerque, nuclear weapons related base. Even now it employs 8,500 people. It's a laboratory, 3,500 are engineers and scientists. That's probably where the wreckage from the Plains of St. Augustine stuff went, including the bodies. And many people have complained about this red-haired officer and black sergeant. Well, I only heard about that from Glenn Dennis the second time around. And then I got a call in a letter from somebody who'd watched the show who said he was out there at the site and he's describing what happened and he too mentions a red-haired officer and a black sergeant. Completely independently, he had no way of knowing of Glenn Dennis's testimony. Well, the interesting thing here, desegregation didn't happen until the following year. Blacks were not well treated in the military. And some people have said there weren't any black sergeants working for white officers. Well, there were. I've met one who worked at a SAC base who handled the dog detail, the canine detail. That's one place where this guy could have worked. And that would explain why he would make such a strange remark as we use guys like you for dog food. So this gives an internal consistency to the story. We would very much like to hear from anybody who knows anything about these stories, won't use witness names without permission. Crash saucers are a very important part of the story of flying saucers. The evidence is overwhelming that responsible, respectable earthlings, people whose testimony you'd like in your side, on your side in a court of law, have indeed on many occasions observed not only saucers sitting on or near the ground, but saucers accompanied by critters, creatures, little guys, whatever you want to call them. I don't mean once or twice. There's a guy in Missouri named Ted Phillips who over the last couple of decades has collected more than 4,400 physical trace cases from 65 countries. These are cases where the saucer is seen on or near the ground, and after it leaves, one finds physical changes, the equivalent of burn circles, burn rings, Landinger marks, swirled vegetation. I don't mean these crop circles. That's a whole other business. Directly associated with the presence of a real craft. 
and frankly, after you read your first 200 cases, it's dull. The same thing keeps happening all over the world. In 24% of those cases, over 1,000, reports are made of creatures associated with the craft. There's a humanoid study group with the Mutual UFO Network, the world's largest respectable uh, UFO group. And uh, they've collected more than 3,000 reports of humanoids. Abduction researchers, and I know a number of professionals who cumulatively have examined well over 1,000 abduction cases. Some of them involving several people at the same time, some of them uh, involving the same people abducted repeatedly over a period of many years. Now, here's a typical physical trace case. This is on the Johnson Ranch, a farm rather, in Delphos, Kansas. Ronnie Johnson, age 16, finishing his chores for the evening, getting ready to go in for dinner, looks up, and here's this glowing mushroom-shaped object sitting a foot or two off the ground, brilliantly lit. Not light bulbs, but just glowing. So bright he could barely see, you know, how you get blinded by bright lights. He's standing there, kind of petrified, and frankly, he was paralyzed. He couldn't move, neither could his dog, so it wasn't psychological. He's standing there, and this thing suddenly takes off. It just clears the shed, whose shadow you can see in the picture, and it moves off slowly in the sky. He dashes into the house, 250 feet, I've been on the farm, tries to tell his parents about this flying saucer that he'd just seen. Naturally, they laughed. They didn't believe him. Naturally, he got angry. You don't have to believe him. You go out and see it for yourself. And they did go out, and they did see it. Then, with a little more effort, he convinced them to go back to the place on their farm where this saucer had been sitting on or near the ground. They get out there and they see this glowing ring of soil. The bottom of the tree was glowing, a board was glowing. This is really weird. Mother reaches down, touches the glowing ring of soil, picks up her hand, her fingers go numb. Can't take pulses at the rest of them where she works as a nurse for the next couple of weeks. They're kind of concerned about this. They take pictures, they call the sheriff's office. The sheriff comes out the next day, takes soil samples, they're worrying about radioactivity. The soil wasn't radioactive. A reporter for the local paper, the Delphos Republican, picks up on the story, because it's on the sheriff's file. This article appears in the story, uh, in the paper, and a month later, Ted Phillips, this guy in Missouri who collects all these physical trace cases, gets sent a copy of the article. He checks with the sheriff, yeah, I know the Johnson family for years, they're fine people. Ted decides to go out there. It had been a month, there had been rain, there had been snow that had melted, but might be worth looking at. He gets out there, everything is mud except for the dry ring of soil. Mud on the inside, mud on the outside, but the ring is dry. Pours water on the ring, runs right off, doesn't get absorbed at all. Took a whole bunch of samples, both in the ring soil, the ring's roughly 10 feet in diameter, and in the inside and outside the ring, in the normal, the control samples. He ran tests. First he ran a seed germination test. The ring soil wouldn't grow anything, the normal soil, the seeds germinated fine. He ran a moisture absorption test. You can see that here. That's water sitting on the dirt. It's not plastic. It's not glue. It's water. This stuff won't absorb moisture. Ted sent me samples of the soil, which you can see here. And I had good agricultural tests done by a professional testing laboratory. They found that the ring soil on the left had a higher level of soluble minerals. These are the things that affect plant growth than the normal soil on the right. They're obviously different in color and texture. That doesn't mean the aliens dumped their garbage here. It probably means that normal soil like that on the right was intensely irradiated with something like microwaves, like cooking a turkey in a microwave oven. It'll penetrate through 14 inches of soil. That's how far down it was dry in this ring. Convert some of the insolubles to solubles. It's a whole new direction for ufological research. Uh, a NASA manager has said that they would test any lab specimens that were required for testing about UFOs. He still hasn't agreed to test any soil samples. We're working on it. We're here at the Astronaut Hall of Fame, and behind me you can see a mock-up of the shuttle. That's the leading edge of today's manned spaceflight technology. It's unclassified. 
but many people seem not to be aware of how much technology has been developed under security. I spent 14 years of my life working on classified advanced research and development programs. They touch every aspect of advanced technology. And not only are there classified programs whose existence is known but whose details are classified, but they're also what are known as black programs, black budget items. These are items that are funded somehow without congressional oversight. How big are these programs? A Pulitzer Prize winning author named Tim Weiner has written an exciting, extremely well-documented book, Blank Check, the Pentagon's Black Budget. He makes a convincing case that the annual black budget, not under congressional control, has been running about $35 billion, about half for technology, stealth fighters, stealth aircraft, and Lord knows what else, and about half for intelligence. And certainly the intelligence community is involved with flying saucers. That's been true from the beginning. Let me give you some demonstrations of that. A group of us called Citizens Against UFO Secrecy, back in the late 70s, went after the CIA, everybody's favorite target, of course. We want all your UFO information. They said, we don't have any UFO information. You do too. We do not. We appeal. They deny. We go to court. There's a procedure under freedom of information. The judge asked that they do a search. They did a very limited search. They suddenly found 900 pages of material. Not terribly exciting, none of it above secret. I've been to 15 different government archives. Loads of top secret stuff has been declassified. Lots hasn't as well. Anyway, more important than the 900 pages of information was a list of 57 documents which they found dealing with UFOs, but that came from other agencies and so they couldn't release them. Everybody and his brother was collecting data about flying saucers. The CIA, of course, was, but the OSI, the DIA, the ONI, FBI's Department of State. Most interesting were 18 documents from the National Security Agency. Now they only give dates, we don't know what's in the documents. So we file a Freedom of Information request with the National Security Agency. And I have to understand, they're the big boys on the block. They spend about 10 billion a year of that blood, uh, budge, black budget, budget, it's a good name for it. And they employ, according to the Washington Post, 160,000 people. And yet half the people in my lecture audiences have never heard of the NSA. No such agency is the inside joke. Anyway, we dutifully file a freedom of information request with the NSA. We want these 18 documents as listed by the CIA. We get a page and a half letter back saying we can't give anybody anything. Public law prevents us from releasing any information about sources and methods of intelligence. We say we don't want sources and methods, just the UFO data. We can't give you anything. We appeal. They deny. We go to court. Uh, the judge asked that they do a search. Now, we only knew about 18 NSA UFO documents. They come back to the judge. He says, how many documents did you find, gentlemen? Uh, 239, Your Honor, from 18 to 239. But 79 of those documents originate with other agencies. We can't release them. Interestingly enough, 23 of those documents were from the CIA but hadn't been found by the CIA when they did their search. Okay, that's fine, at least 160 NSA UFO documents. We'll take those. We can't give you anything, you guys. They said, gentlemen, you don't seem to understand. We're talking national security here. We can't give you anything. We're going around in circles. So we tried a legal ploy that had been done before in other cases. We asked that they submit to the documents to Judge Gerhard Gissel, the federal court judge, so that he could determine whether they are properly invoking national security. They absolutely refused to show him any of the documents. However, they provided him with a 21-page top secret plus affidavit justifying the withholding. He saw it in camera, that is, in his chambers with a special clearance. Naturally, our lawyer didn't get to see that affidavit. The judge was so impressed with that that he ruled in their favor they should not release their 156 UFO documents that the public interest in disclosure, he said, was far outweighed by the potential danger to the security of the United States should this information be released. National security and flying saucers. We appealed to the Federal Court of Appeals. They have oral and written hearings. Uh, the judges normally take two months to make their decision. They were shown the same 21-page top secret plus affidavit. 
and they agreed with the lower court. The Supreme Court wouldn't hear the case. We filed a Freedom of Information request for the 21-page Top Secret Plus affidavit, and eventually we got it. And we expected some censorship in it, and there was. And as one turns the pages, one begins to see that almost all of it is blacked out. About 75 to 80 percent of that document has been blacked out. Now, the judge saw it clean. We didn't. And no, it's not illegal for them to do that. National security is one of the exemptions from freedom of information. Anybody who says no government agency is withholding UFO information simply isn't telling the truth. Now, there's a footnote to the story. I had naturally filed with the CIA for their 23 UFO documents as discovered by the NSA when they did their search. Now, they're supposed to respond in 10 working days. It took them 35 months to respond. I suppose that means they work 10 minutes a day. I don't know. But when they did respond, they agreed to read a release nine of those 23 documents. I was excited until I looked at them. They were press abstracts of Eastern European newspaper articles about flying saucers, which the Russians had the day they were published. Their own 14 documents, they refused to release. They tried to discourage me from appealing. I appealed anyway. Two years later, they responded to my appeal. They agreed to release tiny portions of three of the documents. Now, this is a released CIA UFO document. There are eight words that you can read on the document. Eight words, and they're not exciting words. Title, doc reference, info location, info date, string of numbers. Now, admittedly, these guys have a kind of sense of humor, you might say. This document says, deny in toto. Couldn't even find eight words on the page to release, as if this weren't denied in toto. Anybody who says government agencies aren't withholding UFO information isn't telling you the truth. There's no doubt in your mind, I gather, that the balloon story was a cover story. Absolutely not. We knew that it was a cover story, and, and if, whose idea it was, I, I have the faintest, the faintest idea, but we used that in order to uh, persuade the curiosity of the press. Colonel Blanchard, in order to get out of their way, had backed into the doorway of the cop's office, and I stepped up to him and I said, Colonel, turn sideways. I want to see, too. <laughs> Maybe if I hadn't said that to him, made it obvious that I was there, uh, I would not have been shipped out two weeks later. <laughs> Some people might say, hey, look, so they're holding back data. What else is new? Everybody knows the government hasn't told us all it knows. If it can have a black budget of 34 billion, 35, 36 billion, does it matter? I think it matters a great deal. The best hope I see for a decent future for this planet is an earthling orientation, as opposed to the nationalistic ones, which we all pick up early on and keep the rest of our lives. The easiest way to get an earthling orientation is to recognize that to aliens coming here, we are all earthlings. The differences don't matter, I would expect, to them. So the reason I think this matters is, as a nuclear physicist very much concerned about the proliferation of nuclear weapons, is that we need to move in the direction of the earthling orientation. It's time the government put some of the data out on the table. Now, some people might ask, well, why would the government hold back this information if they had it? Are they afraid of panic, a la Orson Welles in the radio broadcast uh, back in the 30s? Let me give you four, five quick reasons for government cover-ups. One, you want to figure out how the darn things work. You've got records. You set up your secret project. Rule number one for security is you can't tell your friends without telling your neighbors. They watch television. They listen to the radio, read the newspapers. Second problem, what if the other guy figures out how they work before you do? How do you defend against them? You don't want them to know, you know, they know. The third problem is the big one, the political problem. 
If there were to be an announcement tomorrow by highly trusted individuals saying, indeed, some UFOs are alien spacecraft, what would happen? I think church attendance would go up, mental hospital admissions would go up, stock market would go down. But I think the biggest thing that would happen is an immediate push on the part of the younger generation, never alive when there wasn't a space program, for a whole new view of ourselves, indeed, as Earthlings, instead of Americans, Chinese, Russian, Cuban, whatever. And there's the rub. I know of no government on this planet that wants its citizens to owe their primary allegiance to the planet instead of that individual government. Nationalism is the only game in town. Just look around. Fourth reason, certain religious groups have said this is all the work of the devil. There are no other living beings out there anywhere. A fifth reason is economic discombobulation. If an announcement were to be made that indeed some UFOs are alien spacecraft, no matter how carefully, a lot of people would think that soon there'd be new methods of ground transport, air transport, communications, agriculture, energy production, you name it. What does that do to the stock market? Who are the winners? Who are the losers? It's a tough transition. Just look at Eastern Europe right now. They've got freedom, they've had elections, they don't have bread, they do have inflation. We don't know how to make that transition very well. Okay, now, what are my goals about all this th stuff? Very simple. I've got a 16-year-old daughter. I'd like to see her generation act in such a fashion that we could qualify for admission to the cosmic kindergarten. If we can't do that, maybe the cosmic preschool. I think it's the best hope for a decent future for the planet. I have a six-year-old grandson. I hope his generation behaves in such a fashion that we create a planet that is indeed suitable for intelligent life. I don't think we've done a very good job so far. If you have information for me, you know anything about crash saucers, government cover-up, and you don't want your name used, that's okay. Please contact me. Thank you.